uh, okay. Right. Um, it is good to be here. Uh, good to be together here. We've got a full room. Uh, for those of you that are tuning in at home, um, we really want you to feel like you're a part of where we are if you're tuning in at home. So if you could turn your temperature uh, at home down to 62, you would feel just like us right here, and uh, that would feel just so much, much more of the same. Um, just so you know, if you were upstairs in church at early service, it's comfortable up there because uh, the boilers are on. Uh, the, bo the blowers aren't on yet, and, and they're not wired up and so forth. So we've got to push the heat around the building. Uh, it's warm enough in, in, in the sanctuary just by ambient heat. But, um, but down here, you've got to push it down here. So hopefully by next week, we're going to have the, the air handlers. I'm learning a lot more about HVAC than I ever wanted to know <laughs> as I walk around this place. But um, So anyhow, that's where we are. Uh, it's coming. Thank you for your patience uh, enduring this, uh, uh, this conditions here, just being a little cool. Um, but maybe this morning we're going to de develop enough brain power down here, a little mental effort that it will warm it right up uh, in here. All right, I am, as is typical on days, having technical problems, so I'm going to do this. Sorry for everybody viewing in at home that gets to see my head so close. Right there, so we're going to do this. All right? I think that will work. Sorry, not that anybody's really concerned about it, but... Okay, how's that? We'll, we'll do that. That seems to be working. Okay, all right, we're good. Uh, no, <laughs> my, my ego is, is well satisfied. Now. All right, you guys, homework uh, last uh, last week, and uh, each week I'm asking you to read about the next uh, miracle. This was in John five, um, just so that you're aware. This uh, Bible class is going to take the the seven main miracles that are covered in the Gospel of John. Now, the reason it's unique is because the other Gospels cover many more, 15 to 20 miracles in some of the other ones, and yet John just kind of reduces it to these seven. And so you kind of focus on that sometimes in, in your study of the Scripture. And, you know, one great word many times when you're reading the, the Bible is why. Why is this in here? Why does this come here? What's happening before it, after it, and so forth? And so I think when we look at the seven miracles of John, then you kind of go, John must be trying to communicate something, the Holy Spirit through John, uh, about Jesus. Now, I told you uh, the last week and the week before, we've eliminated, not eliminated, but we're not going to discuss the, the miracles like the virgin conception, right, the resurrection, uh, and Jesus' ascension. Those are all miracles, without a doubt. We're dealing with Jesus' miracles that really impact people right there in the flesh. Obviously, the re resurrection has a tremendous impact on us. But that's everyone, everywhere kind of thing. So we're dealing with some of these more uh, uh, localized ones. So let me begin this morning. Uh, if you read the, the homework, you learned this is the healing of the man who was lame uh, for decades and uh, at the pool and, and so forth. So I want to begin with a story to kind of help set us uh, in motion. This is a guy by the name of George Dancy. Uh, now I want to tell you a quick story about George Dancy, mathematician, statistician, uh, he's done some brilliant work. He went to, oh, I forget what university, well, it might have been Cambridge, uh, and he's working on his master's degree. So he's in his young 20s, goes to Cambridge, and walks into a uh, status, uh, statistics class for his master's degree, and uh, he comes in late. Right? Now, the reason that's relevant is at the beginning of the class, the professor was talking about the power of mathematics and so forth, and he said, now, not every math problem is solvable. He said, I'll give you an example. Here's two problems up on the blackboard. And he says, these are unsolvable math problems. Okay? And, and he had written about solve these. Okay? And they just went on to talk about how sometimes math has boundaries and so forth. Uh, George Danson came in 10 minutes later, sees the blackboard, and starts writing down on his notebook, kind of what it must be homework. Right? So um, six weeks later, he comes and he, and he comes and he has a conversation with the with the professor. And says, "I'm sorry that these are so late, but here's the here's the homework." And uh, the professor is absolutely blown away that these two believed to be unsolvable mathematical problems, George Danzig had solved. Now the reason I tell you that story as we begin is that there is a preconceived notion in many of us that says that is not possible. 
When we think about miracles, I think we really start off many times with a mentality that says, well, that's not possible. That's, that's not doable. And, and yet what we're doing is we're kind of boxing God in, in a sense, saying, I don't believe it's possible, so therefore, I'm not looking for it. The rest of his classmates, George's classmates in his master's class of statistics, didn't even attempt the problems because the professor had said, there's no solution. Don't even work on it. Right? And then he thought, well, i got to work on this. It took him six weeks. right? But he solved the problems. In fact, to this day, his uh, statistics and things, they, have, uh, they use those to manage uh, airplane travel around the world and transportation in and out of ports and stuff. All this statistical analysis and, and uh, inner workings and, and things like that. So a uh, pretty incredible story uh, as we can see that. Now, John 5, uh, as we're going to open it up right now, uh, we make too many false assumptions about what it is, what is and isn't possible. Right? We make too many assumptions about what is and isn't possible. Uh, so open up your Bible from first to John 5. If you guys haven't looked up lately, and those of you viewing it at home, you can't. You notice we have new lights. Um, all the grid work is in for our ceilings. That's supposed to be in this week. Uh, so the fact that my head looks a little extra shiny uh, this morning is because of the new lights. So uh, for those of you at home, they're trying to adjust your sense. Uh, now that's the reason why. All right, John 5, 1 through 9. Will somebody read that, please, for us? Thanks and loud. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called the Bethesda, which has five root colonies. In these lay a multiple of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred, and while I am going down steps, when I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Go up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Is that nine? Yes. Good. All right. So there's the basic and the background of our story. So I'm going to get into all the details of what those mean. Uh, some of them are kind of fascinating uh, as we kind of dig through this a little bit historically. But let's look at two things that, uh, that will relate to this. Uh, Matthew and Luke. So ladies, would you look up Matthew 19.26? Gentlemen, would you look up Luke 1.37? Okay, Don? Now that day with the Sabbath, it ends. Verse 9. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, because we do need to touch on that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Ladies, Matthew 19. Gentlemen, Luke 1. But Jesus, but Jesus looked at them and said, The command this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All right. So there's the blunt message of Jesus, right? For those of you that think it is you're making the assumption it's impossible. Let me just explain this. With God, nothing is impossible. Nothing, right? We, we have these binds, uh, this bondage for us in our own mentality, our own intellect that says there are natural laws. I'll, I'll give you a great example. You cannot walk on water, and yet Jesus did, right? We believe that dead is dead, and yet Jesus said, come forth, right? We believe that you cannot create matter. Okay, we can't. We can manipulate, but we cannot create it. And Jesus kind of goes, bread and fish, bing, to everyone. Okay? So you and I were bound by this understanding, this, this intellectual barrier that says there are natural laws, and, and that's why we call them laws. They're not natural suggestions or guidelines. They're laws. Right? And then Jesus kind of goes, yeah, but they're my laws. Right? I can break them if I'd like to. Okay? So, he says that anything that you think is impossible is possible with me. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Luke 1, 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Perfect. All right? Just echoing that. So, let me, let me just make that statement. The word impossible doesn't belong in our vocabulary. The word impossible does not belong in a Christian's vocabulary. Now, there may be people that will take issue with that and say, yeah, but come on. All right? There are things that are impossible. Name one. Name something that is impossible for God to do. Now, can you say that there's something improbable based on our experience? Well, we'll talk about why that is. There is nothing impossible for God. Nothing. That you think of the most outlandish, outrageous request, and that is possible for God. Now, we also trust that God's going to do what's best for us. 
and that God is going to do what is good for him and his name, because, right, the goal is for all people to go where? Heaven. Heaven. That is God's goal for everyone. That's why Jesus came. So anything that points to that, that encourages that, that builds that up, that's what God wants. My kids used to ask, you know, Dad, can I pray for a million dollars when we pray at night? Right? I'm like, yeah, you can pray for that. But do you understand that God has a decision on whether or not you get what you pray for? Right? Is it a good thing for you to have a million dollars? I, most of the time, the Bible speaks very honestly about greed. Right? And, and so you can pray for a million dollars. What I know of God doesn't happen a lot. Right? Because it becomes a God. It becomes an idol. And it goes, well, the last thing I want to do is put something in the way that is going to keep you from me and trusting me and so forth. So can I... Can I can I pray for a million dollars? Yes, you can. God is not beyond anything. But the more you know about God, I always share this with my new members uh, in class. Um, when you learn more about God, you actually learn more about what to pray for. Because you learn about the character of God. You're like, God wants me to be a vessel for his grace. So if you prayed for opportunities to speak to your coworkers or your next door neighbors, guess what you're going to see? Opportunities come up. Because God goes, now that's what I want. And you're like, I'd also like a million dollars. Right? And the guy goes, that's not good for you. Okay? My kids were never little. They'd say, I'd like chocolate cake for dinner. Okay? If I was a good dad, I would say, that's really a great idea. But no. That's not good for you. I, I, have, I have some wisdom and knowledge, hopefully, that steers us away from that. So we let our logical assumptions trump our theological beliefs. Right? We think that we are driven many times by our logical assumptions. Right? We, we make decisions like, I bet God won't do it. Okay? Now, when you think that way, maybe even when you verbalize that out loud to someone, even to yourself, that is a lack of faith. That's a harmful thing to do. I bet God won't do it. Because right away, you're claiming that there is some barrier to it. Now, we're going to talk about why God... You know, at times, what we can learn, why God sometimes will answer certain prayers and not other times. We, we believe, I, I believe every time I pray upstairs and we pray for, for people, I believe most of the time those are all really good prayers. I hope they're not selfish. Right? When I pray for somebody's healing and health and so forth, I believe that's a really good idea. But you guys can hear, I do this on purpose, often I will say, Lord, if it's not your will at this time, here's what's most important. Deepen their faith. Right? Because what's our goal? Heaven. heaven, right? Not having cancer doesn't get you to heaven. Not having COVID doesn't get you to heaven. Having faith in Jesus gets you to heaven. So if God says the cancer is going to be part of what's going to draw you closer to me, and guess what? He loves us enough to allow us to struggle with cancer. Right? I think in my job as a parent, sometimes I put friction in the life of my children in order to have some better results. That's just the nature of loving parents. And in Hebrews, God says, I love my children. That's why I discipline them. Because his goal for us, again, is it, God's always playing the long game. You and I want to play the short game. Right? We're like, but this would make me really happy right now. Right? That million dollars would really help. That lack of cancer in my life would really help. Okay? This resolved struggle in my life or relationship, that would be really wonderful. And yet God says, I look down the road, and this struggle that you're going to have is drawing you closer to me every day as you wrestle with it. And guess what I need? I need you to be close to me so that one day you'll be with me. And so he's willing to sacrifice that. And, uh, and that's hard for us to hear sometimes, to understand. Uh, Henry Ford said this, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. It's a great quote, and I think about that. It really kind of talks about this um, as, as I would think, well, it's kind of mind over matter, isn't it? Uh, it's not, actually. Right? It's actually faith over matter. Mind over matter says you are in control. I just got to think positively. Right? I always think that's, that's interesting. You ever go to the self-help section in a bookstore? It is loaded with books. Right? And, and those books point at the fact that you can make your life better. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can, you know, you can't make certain decisions that are going to help you. But when you're talking about miracles, you're not going to usher in any miracle in your life. You're not going to go, I'm going to just think really positively, and then I can have a miracle. That God's healing will come, or God's help will come. I can tell you the positivity that you feel toward God 
But see, that's not your mind. That's using the faith that God's already given you. Joyce? There are some self-proclaimed ministers that say the same thing. Yeah. If you just believe strong enough, you'll have the miracle. And, and that's false. Because, again, what that does is that puts you in control. Right? Um, I, I've heard the very same thing. I've heard ministers that would say, if you just believed enough. Now, I'm going to tell you this morning that you and I are putting barriers in the way of miracles. I believe that. Okay? This right here is an example of that. I think many times we put, you know, faith at a much lower register. We're like, um, you know, I, I had someone tell me this was uh, earlier this summer. Uh, and they said, I, I don't know how we're going to make it financially. I've lost my job because of uh, quarantine and, and the pandemic and so forth. And it's not going to come back. And, and I'm too old to get a new job and all these things. You see struggles. And I said, I don't see any way out. That's what they told me. And, uh, and I said, I see. I see a way. And I said, it just happens to be the way. And I said, I, I can't tell you what the answer is, but I can tell you that Jesus still loves you, that he is on the throne, and nothing is impossible for God. And, and, uh, and so we have, this person and I, uh, have been committing ourselves to prayer, uh, very specifically for a job for this individual. And, uh, and I can tell you that a job has come up, and a job has happened. And, uh, and it's starting to develop, and, and there's opportunity and so forth. But I can tell you, God didn't just gift wrap it and drop it in his lap in a week. He did what God often does. Work with me. Right? Grow. Depend on me. If God is just a vending machine, whenever I'm in trouble, push in the right coins, hit the right buttons, and ching, I get my chips. Right? Or I get my job, or I get my help. And then you go, well, I only come to God when I'm in trouble. And I'm like a kid. I'm like, I want, I want, I want. Instead, God goes, I help you. Let's walk this a little bit. Right? I think of uh, people that are recovering from alcoholism. You know, they talk about how many days of sobriety and how many weeks and how many months. It's a day-by-day -day exercise. It is not just kind of like, I think I'll just stop wanting alcohol. And then it just comes to a screeching halt. Nope. No. And so God many times, he says, I'm going to grow you, but I'm going to grow you throughout your life and throughout your walk. That's my hope. Uh, because only through that do you really learn to depend on God. If God just delivers everything at one time, again, you only come to God when you're in trouble. Right? And, and it's, it's like I only, you know, it's like if I only went and, and said nice things to my wife when I needed something. Right? You know, dear, have I told you how beautiful you are? Right? By the way, I need this. Right? After a while, she'd be like, oh, stop doing that. Right? That's so conceived and, and, and deceitful. Right? So um, it's not mind over matter, but it's faith over matter. In fact, faith doesn't ignore the doctor's diagnosis, but it does get a second opinion from God. You have to call God a great physician. I've sat next to hospital beds. Members of mine, or family of mine, or just even sometimes strangers. When I was in St. Louis, uh, it was interesting. Uh, one of the things you're, you're supposed to do, I was a second career student at the seminary, which means I was older than a lot of the guys around. And uh, I was at uh, Lutheran Church at Webster Gardens in St. Louis, if you know where that is. Uh, that's where I started out. So I was a seminarian student. They call us field workers uh, when you're assigned to a church. It's kind of like student teaching, if you kind of understand the concept. And, uh, and so the pastor there, um, who, is, who is still there, um, assigned all the, the, uh, the field workers, the seminary students, to go and make visits at the hospital. Go learn how to interact with people and pray with them and so forth. And he would give us sometimes a list of our members, you know, and so forth. So I would go there to see my, uh, my member, the members of the church where I serve. Now, you guys don't see me in a, in a clerical shirt very often. I just don't wear it. I don't have a problem with it. I just don't kind of have it. Um, but the black shirt with the white collar, Okay. Now, walking around in a hospital in St. Louis wearing a clerical shirt would be similar to walking around a hospital here. What do people think I am? Catholic. 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 <laughs> Father? Yeah. Father, come here, right? And, you know, and there'd be somebody who is, who is fading in a hospital room. Would you please give last rites? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'll be glad to pray with you. I, I, I'm, I'm Lutheran, and I, they usually go, oh. <laughs> you know, you're kind of Catholic light. You know, it's, you know, it's kind, of, kind of different. But, uh, but a lot of times there were opportunities. Uh, many times. I'd be in an uh, elevator riding up there like, Father, we're here to see you. Yeah. It just got tiresome trying to explain it. I would just go, 
uh, just <laughs> but there would be opportunities to pray right and be able to talk and be able to say and say listen the doctors have, have come in and they've got bad news and I've been there when the doctors have come in and said hey there's nothing more than we can do and then just watch that just this life empty out of the people sitting in the room just going oh there's all the hope we had to hope in this surgery or this treatment and so forth and I, I often have the opportunity to be able to say okay good to know let's pray not let's pray for easing of passing or, or things like that. Let's actually consult the one who we were thinking might use doctors, might use treatments and technology. He uses those as extensions of his grace and mercy. But, but sometimes he decides to act a miracle. I, I have been a uh, witness to those in my past. I imagine some of you have too. Where you go in and they're like, well, we're going to do one more CAT scan before the brain surgery, and we're going to see how big the mass has gotten to see what we need to do. And then they go in for that, that, you know, that picture taking and we're waiting in the waiting room. And I'm like, they said they were going to be out in an hour. It's been three hours already. I hope nothing bad happened. But the nurse was going to come out and give us updates and things like that. And they finally come out. This was in the Cleveland Clinic when I was down in Ohio. And uh, the surgeon finally came out talking to the family. I didn't happen to be there uh, sitting with them. And uh, they said, listen, we've taken three times the number of pictures we usually do. And we're like, oh, boy, that doesn't sound positive. We can't find anything. It was a, it was a tumor that had grown into the ear canal, um, and it destroyed all the ear bones and, and things in the eardrum and things like that. They said, we're taking a picture, and all the bones in the ears are there. And the eardrum is there, and there's no mass. And they've been praying, you know, praying and praying and praying for weeks through this person's church and, and through that thing. And you see that, and I just watched this mom just fall to pieces in joy. And, and the doctor goes, I don't have an explanation for that. I'm not going to pass up that opportunity. And I said, I do. <laughs> I said, we've actually been working on this for months. For months. And, and I, just, I, I just wanted to say it as matter of fact as I could. It wasn't me. It was God. All God. I just got to be there. I got to be the one to kind of put the exclamation point at the end of the, the story. To be able to go, it was God. Doctor, the reason you don't have an explanation for it is there isn't a medical explanation. But there is one from the great physician where he says, this would bring me glory. So I'm going to choose to do it. Right? And he chooses to do it. Um, so if you have your Bibles open, go back to uh, John 5. I want you to open up to 5. John 5, so we can kind of walk through this. John chapter 5. Let's look at verse 6. And I want to talk about this mountain of a word, want. All right? Verse 6. Uh, Don, you read it before. Would you read it again for me? When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? <laughs> that just seems, I don't know. It, it either seems um, unkind, you know, is it, is it an icebreaker for Jesus? Hey, you've been lame for 38 years. By the way, that's not his whole life. That's the reason they said 38 years. So we don't know what took place. Accident, fall, birth defect, we're, we're not sure. But at some point in time, it doesn't say he'd been lame for life. Because they actually point that out in other circumstances in the Bible. They would have said, lame since birth. But 38 years, I want you to know something about the time of Jesus' time. This is well beyond uh, life expectancy. Most people didn't live to 40 in Jesus' time. And that would be healthy people, working people, active people. You can imagine, he is neither. Not healthy, he's not active. Uh, in fact, he spends, apparently, every day at the pool. Because of some belief that we're going to talk about in a second. So there's this mountain of the word want. Do you want to be healed? In fact, while you're um, looking there, here's what I want you to understand. Uh, there's some data I found that's important for us. 80% of the health problems in our country, 80% are caused by five issues. 80% right? of the health issues in our country are caused by five behavioral issues. Too much eating, too much drinking, smoking, stress, and not enough exercise. 80% of the problems you and I have uh, are caused by those things. How many of those things do you control? All of you. You understand the power of the word want? Now I'm going to say something not really all that popular with people. If you want to be skinnier, guess what? You have to want to be skinnier. If you want to be healthier, you know why things are so popular today just take a pill, get a surgery, do something? Because we don't want to do the hard work. Right? If you want to be a stronger Christian, you don't just pray for deeper faith. You open up your Bible. 
And people tell me, I just don't hear from God. And I often ask myself, do you read the Word? And they're like, well, no, I'm not in a real good habit of that. Well, what do you expect if that is the voice of God? Right? Well, I just don't feel connected to God. Do you come together to church? Right? To wrestle with other believers? To walk this walk? No, not really so much. Well, then you don't want to have a deeper relationship with God. I have couples that come in and say, I, I, I want to have a better relationship. When you want to, does it translate into doing something about it? Or do you just go, Pastor, fix them? Which is often what I hear, right? And they're like, this is what I want. I said, no, wanting is you got to do something, right? Now, I'm not suggesting doing means salvation, but God often wants some engagement. He's invested himself in your creation. He intends for you to make a difference in this world. So the last thing he wants to do is have some couch potato out there toting that you are a believer. He doesn't want that. Or a pew potato. Okay? He doesn't want that. He says, so guess what? I want you to grow. I want you to stretch. And if it means that you're going to suffer a little bit so it brings you to that place. When I was a coach, when I was a teacher in high school, I coached three sports. Um, and, and what I often had to do was get my players physically able to compete. Right? When I was a soccer coach, probably one of my favorite, favorite games, my son Noah plays in college and so forth. One of the things I had to do is so that my players could run five, six miles at a time. Because again, you have to run around a lot with soccer. Okay? I didn't just sit them down in a room and say, we're going to watch film of soccer games. You guys are going to get great. No. I had to get you out there and go, you just have to run. They're like, well, when do we get to play with the ball? As soon as you can run five or six miles without stopping. They're like, but we want to do the fun things. They said, well, first of all, we've got to build your body up. God does the same thing. Before you're going to go out there and be a witness, guess what? I need you to actually be a light. I need to get you some batteries and a bowl. Okay? And I need you to be that. I can't just simply kind of go, oh, yeah, go ahead. Right? Sometimes as a pastor, I'll get somebody that will come to me, and they come to join the church, they get really excited about Christianity, and maybe they're kind of new to it or, or renewed to it, and then sometimes they jump in with both feet and go, I really want to go do this. And there's, as a pastor, i got to go, hang on a second. Let's let that mature a little bit. Let's take some steps that, right, before you start to tell other people what is right and wrong about a relationship with God, let's learn what that is. Take your time. Same reason we don't necessarily, you know, put an eight-year-old behind the wheel of a car. We'd like you to grow and develop a little bit. Oh, it's got to be able to reach the pedals. Okay? Certain things. All right. Um, you can't help someone who doesn't want Help. Somebody have Luke 23, 39 for me? Luke 23, 39. One of the criminals who was hanging railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Here's what I want you to understand. The reason I added that one in there uh, with the thief on the cross is it's this. It's never too late to ask for a miracle. Never. It is never too late. Sometimes we kind of go, oh, it's just there's so much time. There is, um, I shared this with you before, there's been times where I've sat at a, uh, at a hospital room, sometimes at home, at hospice, and sat with someone and, and have the, I think it's a, an honor to have this conversation. But, uh, you know, hospice and doctors have said there's there's nothing else we can do. Uh, it's, we're going to talk about transitioning comfortably and, and so forth. And we can continue to pray for God's healing. But you understand, from a Christian standpoint, if our goal is heaven, then there comes a point at which we're like, listen, if your body isn't going to hold out anymore, why would we keep you here? Right? I don't want to throw an anchor here and kind of go, no matter what, let's, let's keep you alive. If, if I'm pretty comfortable that you're going to heaven, we shouldn't hold that up. That doesn't mean I'm unplugging things, right? I don't mean to be crass, but, but we, you know, this idea of doing these extensive um, actions to say, I want to keep you ambulative, and I want to keep you alert and alive and so forth and wired up to all sorts of machines. If, if you're going to go to heaven, let you go to heaven. I remember when my dad was dying. They had hospice in the house, and cancer just racked his body, and, and we as a family, we were just praying, Lord, if you want to heal him, praise the Lord. I will yell at from the mountaintops, but if you want to take him home, my feeling is, take him home. This is hard, right? It's hard for him, it's hard for the people, and, and so forth. It just seems like a life that doesn't have the same kind of impact that, that I would, you know, want for him, and he would want for us, and, and, and even the world needing, and so forth. So it's okay for that, but there are times when I sit by someone's bedside, and I ask them, 
Um, if this is your time, are you, do you believe you're going to go to heaven? That's an important question. And, uh, and often I will get, I'm usually visiting people that are, uh, that are believers. That's kind of how I get engaged in the conversation. Most of the time they will say, I think so, or yes. But then comes the all important follow-up the question is, why? If God meets you at the pearly gates and asks, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell them? And I can tell you that it happens more than I wish it does when they say, because I've been pretty good. I mean, I've been better than most people. Well, maybe not most, but some. And then I usually kind of turn it around on them. I'm kind of like, do you think that's what it comes down to? you got to be good? Yep. I think i got supposed to be a good person. See, that's sometimes our message as Christians. We tell our kids that. You sit in church, be good. Okay? But we don't necessarily explain what we mean by that. We're just like, be good. If you're going to be in church, you've got to be good. Right? And uh, sometimes I'll ask the person I'm talking to, do you have to be better than me? I'm a pastor, right? My ticket's punched. Okay? <laughs> Not poking fun, obviously. And they're like, most of them are like, well, no, I can't be better than a pastor, right? Your ticket's punched. You've been told me. Okay? I said, it is not about being good. None of us can be good enough. That's why Jesus came. If it was about being good, Jesus didn't have to come. You just have to follow the rules and do it as good as you possibly can. And then it's totally hopeless because you realize you can't. And that's when I get a chance. A lot of times when I'm holding their hand or talking with them, I'll close my eyes and I'll say a little quick prayer. And I'll say, Lord, 30 minutes. That's all I'm asking for. 30 minutes. Let me tell them the good news. That it is not about how good you are, but instead of how good you are. By your grace and your mercy. And so, so that I can speak very honestly, not only to them, but of them afterwards. I can tell you one of the one of the more uncomfortable things. I had this experience last week. I did a uh, a committal service for uh, for someone. Will and I were at it uh, over at Hawthorne. It was just a family that didn't have a home church, and and uh, sometimes I volunteer to do that with the funeral homes because it's an opportunity to share the gospel, uh, even with people that I'm not necessarily directly responsible for. And uh, I can tell you by talking to the wife and the family and so forth, I had no idea where this man's faith was. And so I can't proclaim there at the graveside with all confidence we believe that this individual is in heaven now and in the presence of God. That's not a good thing, right? But what I'd love to do as a pastor, and, and funerals aren't necessarily something you love to do, but I do love to proclaim the promise to be able to say, I talk to this individual. I have ministered to this individual. I know they know Jesus and love Jesus, and he's waiting for us on that day, that great reunion when we come together in heaven. That's what I want to be able to say. I want to be able to say that at every funeral that I officiate. And, and there's only one way to do that, and that is to trust uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. All right? So we can become, that is the problem with the, the man at the pool, when he comes into our crutches. Do you want to be healed? Somehow Jesus saw something in his heart that maybe caused pause to be able to say, let's see, before I do this, God's God, he knows what's going to happen. Before I do this, I need you to... Uh, I need you to say something here. Not that it brings the healing, but it brings your mind and heart into alignment with what I want for you. Do you want to be healed? This wasn't just an icebreaker of, I don't know what else to say. Uh, two Jews walk into the synagogue and one says the other, you know. This is, this is asking someone like, say, excuse me, do you want to be healed? And I imagine he must have thought, <laughs> I've been here for 38 years. I come to this pool every day. People drag me here and drag me back and, and so forth. And I keep trying to get down to the pool and, and so forth. Of course I want to be healed. But I think Jesus asked me the deeper question. Do you really want it, though? Because you've been there for 38 years. You and I know that there are people that hang on to something for 38 years for all the wrong reasons. Right? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's weakness. Maybe it's just uh, insecurity, and we hang on to it far too long. You know how we, um, when your kids get older, we try to take that blanket away? At least we should, <laughs> right? You're kind of like, well, enough with the blanket, okay? You don't have to hold on to that anymore. Let it go. Find your comfort in something that is real, not something that is material, quite literally, right? And then that's actually what he's asking of the man here. So what new expectations would the man be under if he's healed? Right? What new expectations? What would he have to do if he suddenly has legs that work? Explain why. Explain why. That's the short term. Yep. But long term, what is this man going to have to do? What's the expectations on him? Is he going to continue to beg? He's going to work. He's going to have to 
to get a job. Right? You're going to go, now that you've been on your mat, do you have any skills? And he's probably thinking, right? I'm not sure that all this is processing through. But he's saying, if you want to be healed, you realize what this is going to change for you. It's not just, oh, my legs work, right? And just does a little jig, you know, and he's excited. And then the, the reality is kind of going, I've been coming to this pool for 38 years. Okay, what now? And people around the guy are going, get a job, right? Maybe have a family. Maybe uh, help lead worship at the synagogue, right? Uh, help park camels outside, whatever. You've got a job to do, right? You've got to do something. You have begged and, and been a, a recipient of people's goodwill for so much long. So long now, then now it's time to contribute in a different way. That changed. We have a problem. I don't want to get political here. We have a problem in our country, the people that receive too much. And they get so used to receiving, they have a hard time contributing. And, and sometimes we enable that. We're like, just keep your crutches. Right? Jesus could have said to the man, uh, told him, like, I'm really sorry that you're crippled. And moved on. Right? And just left him there. Not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually as well. There are some examples I've, I've written down here of things that people have had to do uh, sometimes differently. Uh, Naaman was the example of that uh, military guy that comes to Elijah and says, uh, I've got leprosy and I need healing. And uh, he finds out there's a man of God. It's kind of a long story of how it all comes together. But uh, Elijah tells uh, Naaman, he says, go down to the Jordan River and wash seven times. And the man, Naaman's kind of insulted. He goes, listen, if you're a man of God, just heal me. Right? And he says, no, God told me to tell you to go wash in the Jordan seven times. Wash your clothes, wash your body. And then he comes out after seven times clean of leprosy. Now, leprosy, leprosy is a death sentence. No cure for it uh, back then. And so he's, he's facing death. And so this, this big shot military general basically comes to this lowly, kind of nutty uh, prophet, right? And, uh, and, and heard from a servant girl that's in his care uh, that this man of God can do these things or might do these things. And comes to him. He comes to him with all of his horses and chariots kind of showing off. And I'm, I'm so important. And, and he just kind of goes, go down and watch in the Jordan. It's kind of a dirty river. Right? we got great rivers back home. Tell me to go watch in a, in a nice river, a clean river, a pool. Or, or have people bring in, you know, bottled water. Not directly bottled water, you know my point. And, and so he goes, no, go down and watch in the Jordan. And he does these heal. Right? And, and so the expectation was, follow it. But the directions are for you. The woman that grabs onto Jesus' cloak uh, and is healed, had to fight through the crowd to do so. Could have just wallowed in self-pity. She'd been sick for so, so long. Uh, the disciples, uh, you know, when he told them, he says, uh, you catch anything today? And they're like, no, we've been fishing all night. He said, throw the nets on the other side. Now, fishermen, they understand that that's the same water that's on this side. Right? Now, I've fished before and found some funny things that work. Right? But I've never kind of gone, yeah, I didn't catch anything over here. Wait, on this side of the boat, there's tons of fish. Like they're all sitting on the east side of the boat for some reason. But they follow God's direction and they find that. What part of your routine are you maybe willing to change? When you think of God enacting a miracle in your life, what are you willing to change? Verse 8. Verse 8. Um, verse 8. Healings are the exception, not the rule. I'm telling you something you already know, but it's important for us to understand, right? They are the exception, not the rule. So Jesus does it, God does them, for a reason, okay? So let me be clear about something. Um, heaven is going to be the place where there's nothing else broken. There's no sin, there's no damage to the body. The body is glorified, everything is perfect. I'm not going to need glasses in heaven. Um, uh, I'm not going to creak and groan when I get roll out of bed uh, and so forth. The body is going to be absolutely perfect, going to be glorified, perfect. Okay, so to think that all things should be made right on this side of the resurrection is naive. Jesus did not come to heal every person that was blind. There are still the consequences of sin in this world. And those consequences drive us to the cross. At least that's what they're meant to do. So if God removes all suffering on this side, are you looking to him anymore? No, that's the danger. Right? If he says, Lazarus, come forth. And by the way, everybody else that's died as well. Now you go, well, that's really a nice thing until you realize there's going to be 7 billion more people on the planet all of a sudden and not necessarily know Jesus. Most of the time when Jesus enacted a miracle, one of the first things he said, your faith has made you well. 
Your faith is actually the key. Why? Because God says, I want you to be in heaven one day. I don't want you to walk healthily, right, on two good legs down to hell. So the most important thing is your heart. And so he allows those things uh, to happen. Right? God won't answer, however, 100% of the prayers you don't pray. Right? He will not answer 100% of the prayers that you don't pray. And if he does answer, you could probably make this argument, you're not going to be paying attention. Right? If God does an act of miracle, I think he does around us at times. I think there's things that God does. You and I just miss them. I can tell you one of my personal prayers most of the time in the morning. Uh, I pray in the shower. Uh, that's a, a time when I don't have to think a lot. Uh, I'm not washing and rinsing my hair, obviously, so it's uh, pretty easy to kind of be on autopilot in the shower. Uh, and this is more than you want to know about your pastor. Uh, but I figure I'm about as exposed to God at that moment that I'm going to be all day. And so when I pray, I'm like, Lord, here's kind of what I want you to know about me. Right? Here's what I want you to hear and see and know and so forth. And I will often pray to God, Lord, if I'm missing things that you are telling me and showing me and so forth, would you sensitize me to it? Kick me in the rear, knock me upside the head, use a billboard, a neon sign, whatever it takes. Because I'm sure daily I miss you. I miss your hand. I miss your voice. I, I miss things that you're doing around me because I'm distracted or I have a different idea and I just assume that I'm right. And I ask God, just point me in that direction. Give me some direction that I can have. Like, for instance, Joshua. I believe that he didn't assume that the sun couldn't stand still. In that story where God actually stops the sun, uh, stops the earth, technically, right? And, and gives him more time uh, to get where he was going. Uh, or Elijah, uh, when he says, toss that axe handle in the water and watch it float, because that's a message for me. Uh, he threw it in there because he didn't assume that it was impossible. Right? He said, okay, Lord, this seems bizarre. Uh, Mary, she didn't assume that virgins couldn't get pregnant. She learned that you do. And she understood it and trusted it. Uh, Peter, he didn't assume that you could actually walk on water, but he did get out of the boat. When he said, Lord, call me out there, he didn't say, let me fly out there to you. Or would you come get me and let me take a piggyback ride out on the Sea of Galilee. He said, call me out there. I know that you can't walk on water, but you are. And if you are, maybe I can. It's kind of like uh, baseball. Uh, I'm saying I refuse to step in the batter's box because I won't get a hit every time. Right? The whole point of baseball is to try to be effective when you're up there at the plate. Everybody bats just about. Right? And every time you get up there, if you're afraid that you're not going to get a hit, that will cost you effort in the box. Right? You'll go, well, I'm not even going to bother swinging because I struck out last time. Good baseball players have short memories. It's kind of what they say. When I played baseball in college, my coach always told me that. He said, you've got to develop a short memory. Because I'd come in, you know, fifth inning, and the goes, Glenn Hill, you're up. And I'm like, ah, oh, I fouled out, and I struck out last time. This pitcher is so good. He said, you've got to go up there and believe that you can hit the ball. And so when you pray, right, we believe that God can do the impossible. If you go up there and kind of go, dear Lord, I bet this is going to be another strikeout. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's going to go, what can I possibly do for you, right, to make this true? And if I do something, you're going to chalk it up to something else or you're going to miss it, okay? I remember uh, if you were at Advent last Wednesday when uh, Zechariah gets the word from the angel. God has heard your prayer. You're going to have a son. And he goes, how is that possible? Uh, let's see. Let's review. Angel from God comes down, came from his presence. He's got this message for you. What else do you need? Right? Tell you what, wait nine months and tell me, call me back and see what happens, right? Um, it's true, it's happening. Uh, the man's handicap, I think, was more mental than it was physical. Maybe, right? Do you want to be healed? What's keeping you? Right? Did he pray day in and day out for healing? I don't know. But what was it that kept him from uh, receiving that? A lot of times for us, it's mental. So there he is, sitting at the, the pool. Jesus comes down and talks to him. Um, in verse 10, uh, it talks about uh, the uh, healing on the Sabbath. Uh, that's actually the beginning of 9. And jo Jesus, I love this, Jesus chose to this day uh, to heal him. By the way, um, how am I doing on time? Woo, we're there. And... Uh, <laughs> By the way, the, the stirring of the pool, I just want you to know, this uh, pool, they've discovered it, they found the pool, and uh, they found that it is a, a spring fed. And the spring would get what they call turbid pressure, back pressure, and periodically would go, boo, 
Right? You'll kind of see that in old houses and in toilets and things like that. that There's back pressure because of where it's laying out, uh, and it'll back up the water and it'll bubble. And, and so somewhere along the line, there was a story that came up. That was when an angel would come down, invisible, right, and stir the water. The first one in gets a healing. So that's what it says. So when the water is disturbed, he said, I can't get down there quick enough because I can't move my leg. And somebody else gets down there in front of me, and I'm like, oh, another lost opportunity, right? And so he was constantly discouraged. Now, the reality, I'm sure, was not the first one in the water. Somebody came out and went, I can see, I can hear, I, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but he believed that. Now, you know, when you're desperate, sometimes you believe anything, right? Believe, do this, and, and it'll happen. In the Jewish culture, they had what they call a mitzvot. That was an additional 613 additional laws added to the Ten Commandments. They're not ones written out in the Bible. They're added on by people like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the Sadducees. And they did that to really kind of control people. Um, again, I, I kind of poke fun a little bit at, at our Catholic brothers and sisters. But there's things in the Catholic practice that are very much legalistic. You have to do this. If you don't do this, then this is not... Available. It's not true for you. And, and so even in Jewish time, that's why Jesus was so hard on the Pharisees, because they would say things like this. So things like don't heal on the Sabbath. They, they have ridiculous Sabbath rules, right? You can't take a bath on the Sabbath. You know why? Not only is taking a bath considered work, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, but if you splash water on the floor and it inadvertently mops the floor because of that water, you've broken the Sabbath. But that's a silly reason not to take a bath. I, if I had kids back in biblical times and they stay, I would want to wash my kids, right, um, and, and so forth. You can't walk too far on the Sabbath because too much walking is uh, against the rules, and you're working. However, if you own something, like if I put some of my possessions back in the garage back there on the back of our lot, I'm actually allowed to walk that far because I have stuff back there, and so that's considered still part of me. I can't walk farther beyond that. So you know what I end up doing? Just putting my stuff around. <laughs> my neighbor holds on to my mower, my other neighbor holds on to my, my clippers, and I can walk around from neighbor to neighbor because I'm not breaking the Sabbath. And yet another guy can't walk around because he hasn't distributed his stuff around. You tell me if that's really about loving and respecting God. Jesus was often pointing out the spirit of God's law. Right? I love you, so I want to heal you. And they would say, no, 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 the, the actual law is, is you cannot do this. You can't heal on the Sabbath. So they, they yell at the man for picking up his mat and walking away. Take up your mat, you are healed. And he picks up his mat and he walks away. He goes, hey, 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 Sabbath day. You're carrying your mat. You can't do that. And, and he's like, you don't understand. I have been a cripple for 38 years. Jesus just told me to get up and take up my mat. I'm listening to him. Right? In fact, I'll tell you that if you follow Jesus, you won't break any of God's laws, but you will occasionally break some of man's. Maybe even often. Right? There may be things that we will break. And again, I, I preached on this about a month ago. We talked about you honor God by honoring Caesar. Right? And we talked about your honor of, of those in authority. That honor only extends as far as God's work. If our government tells you to do something that is opposite of what God says, we don't follow it. Just don't. I'm not talking about anarchy. I'm just talking about, you know, in countries around this world where they say being a Christian is illegal. Guess what? Still be Christian. Still live that Christian life. Still do what Christians do uh, and so forth. And you deal with the consequences. Right? God doesn't say, be my disciples as long as it's easy. As long as it's safe. He says, you follow my law. All right. Thinking outside the box, verse 7, if Jesus chose to solve the invalid's problem as presented, he would have simply moved him closer. Notice what he said every time something, the water is disturbed. I can't get there in time. So Jesus could have said, okay, I'm just going to move you down to the bottom step. That way when it's disturbed, you can just roll in if you believe that's going to help. If, if Jesus wanted to do it. So here's the, here's the problem with you and I. Sometimes we pray for the wrong things. Right? Lord, here's what would help. I was talking to this individual, talking about a new job. And they're kind of like, I just need money to pay my bills. And, and I, I think it's safe to say, in my experience with this individual, that I don't think that's how God's going to answer his prayers. I think he's going to do something else. I think the result will ultimately be, I'm going to care for your family. But it's not just about providing just this. Right? God's not going to say, all right, uh, go dig in the backyard under this tree, and you're going to find a, a chest full of money. And there you go. There's the answer to your problem. Instead, he's like, no, nah, actually, I'm going to take this from a different direction. So we have to be open to the idea that God may answer us a little bit differently. 
He just thought, listen, I can't get down there. That's the problem. Could you help me? Right? Or could you give me some solutions? Instead, he says, how about you just get up and walk? Let's just not create this problem anymore. Let's just solve it. All right? Um, let me just skip that Philippians 4. You can read that on your own if you like. We should never say I can't, but we should say I don't know often. And what I mean by that is we don't understand God's ways. So what I want to do is I want to ask God, would you show me? Would you tell me? Would you give me some insight, some understanding? And I can tell you, the more you pray, the more God has opportunity to speak into your heart. Sometimes he does through his word. Sometimes he does through his church. Sometimes he just does to your spirit. But if you say, Lord, I don't know what you want in this. I just kind of had a quandary about what's happening. I don't know what to pray for and so forth. I love those words in Romans where he says, even when you don't know what to pray for, the groans of your heart are carried by the Holy Spirit to God. Which means you don't actually have to verbalize it. It doesn't mean you're lazy and just kind of go, hey, God, you know. Right? Because part of that connection is, right, submitting to that uh, understanding. God is predictably unpredictable. God is predictably unpredictable. And that is absolutely true. All right. Uh, that's where we'll finish up for today. Your assignment for next week, John 6. John 6, 5 through 13. A uh, great miracle there. Great miracle to talk about. We close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your love, uh, for your joy over us as your creation. And, and Lord, may we seek miracles. Uh, Lord, because too often we just believe that ah, it's just not going to happen. They don't happen very often. Um, Lord, I, I believe there's reasons they don't happen very often. It's, it's because one, we don't ask. Two, we're not looking for them. And three, uh, our faith is just not there. And so, Lord, may those miracles uh, happen. May they be proclaimed. May they be celebrated. And may they excite us as your church. Uh, Lord,